Hello, welcome back everybody. As I mentioned at the end of the last video, this time we'll focus on the Meteor and its custom shader. And we already have some grey backstories for the origin of this explosion. So apparently, these guys were harvesting this rock as a source of energy for a long time, but it wasn't actually a rock. It was an egg, and eventually it became sentient and started escaping from its human-made prison, which is what we see now. Okay, I love you guys. Thank you, Andrew, for the great prompt. Keep them coming, guys. I love hearing this series. And I might as well ask ChatGPT what he thinks about it. But for the time being, we'll just go back on VS Code. And I did make some small adjustments compared to where we left off on part one. For instance, I did change the vectors that were being used in perspective camera and orbit controls. And on every file reference, I've removed the forward slash. So not only on the environment maps in app.jsx, but also all the files that were referenced inside the scene component. I just removed the forward slash. And inside vth.config.js, I've included the base property. And with this one, it will be possible for you to pick the build files of the project and drop them in any subfolder of your website instead of requiring your project to live at the root level of your website. Great, now we can actually create the components for the Meteor or the human-made prison, depending on your faction. And the only thing that's new here is the mesh transmission material. I absolutely love this one. It's an expansion of the transmission shader available on Tree.js, and there are a gazillion properties you can use to tune the look of this material. And the easiest way to understand what each property does and to find the preset that you like the most would be to play with the properties themselves. You can do that on this webpage, I'll link it in the description of the video. And after you find a preset that you like, you just have to import the Meteor object inside the suspense block of the app and that should be enough for you to see it on the scene. And with the properties that I've selected, this is the look that I'm getting. I'm pretty happy with this one. Um, it's a translucent material. You can partially see what sits behind it. And the only difference from the material that we had in the original scene is that we also had a rim light effect on the edges of the of the rock. That's an interesting type of effect that we want to achieve because it depends on the camera position. So. If the camera is positioned right here, then the effect needs to be visible here. But if we're changing the camera position again, then the position of the effect would have to change as well. So to my knowledge, there's no readily available material in the TreeJS library that can achieve this effect. So we will create our own material with no toy. All right, I'm not going to show you how to create a new no toy project. I'm confident that you guys are smart enough to figure that on your own. You just have to hop on their website and follow the procedure until you get to this screen where you can create a new material. And once you get there, that's where all the magic happens. Notoy is very similar to the shader editor in Blender. You can use your mouse wheel to zoom in and out, the right mouse button to pan around the canvas, and most importantly, you can create nodes to edit the look of your materials. Now let's try this together. So to spawn a new node, you have to right click on an empty part of the canvas, and I'm going to select a color node, and I'll give it a bright red value that I'll then attach to the albedo channel of the master node and the master node from my understanding maps to a mesh standard material in TreeJS. But you can see that the material did change and this is already interesting. We can change the color on the node and it will update the output on the node editor. We can go one step further. So let me right click again and select the float. So this is used for numerical values. For example, roughness is not a vector, it's a, num it's a numerical value between 0 and 1. So let me attach this node to the roughness and let's say that I want 1 as an input for roughness and the material did change. But what's also super interesting about this node is that we can use min and max values to turn this into a slider. And if we do that, it's even easier to add the properties of this material and see how they change the result in the node editor. I can duplicate this node, attach it to the metallic component, and now we can also add the metallic properties of the material. All of this in a visual editor that makes it super easy to edit the properties of the material and see the output. Now we're barely scratching the surface, but something else that I wanted to show before we move on is how the world normal looks like when we are attaching it to the albedo color. So if you're unfamiliar with what a normal is, it's basically a vector that points away from a surface. So in this case, we have a plane and this is the normal vector. It's perpendicular to the surface and it creates a 90 degrees angle with the surface itself. And when we're using a 
curved model or a curved surface. Every point in the surface will have as its normal a vector that points away from it, like we're seeing in this picture. So let me try to explain what's happening here on a shading level. So every time we're rendering one of the pixels of this mesh, this little program will run. And instead of thinking of this box as the output of the entire material of this mesh, try to think of it as the output of the single pixel that we are rendering because each pixel can potentially have different properties compared to the other ones. So let's take as an example one of the pixels that sits at the top of the mesh right here. So every pixel is associated to a specific point in space that is occupied by the mesh. And the pixels that are sitting at the top of the mesh will likely have their normal pointing up in the direction of this green arrow. And when a normal points upward, the vector representation of the normal usually has a y value that is close to one. And when the y value of a vector is close to one, if you interpret this as a color, you'll get green. And since we're using the representation of the normal vector as a color of the output of each pixel that we are shading, this is going to be the output. So each pixel of this mesh will have as its color the vector representation of the normal and the direction where it's pointing to. And the main point that I'm trying to drive home here is that each pixel is associated to a specific point in space in the surface of the mesh and each, each pixel can be shaded differently depending on the program that we're running as a node shader. Again, a note shader takes as an input, even if it's not visible here, but what we're taking as an input is a pixel and the surface properties of that pixel. All right, moving on. I did change the type of the master node to be unlit, and this is going to make it a little bit easier to explain what I'm trying to do now. So now I'm taking the world normal of the pixel that I'm shading, so the normal of the pixel that I'm shading, and remember each pixel is sitting on a specific point in space on the surface of the model. And I'm also taking the view direction, which is basically the direction that is used to point towards the eye of the observer, which is going to be us and the camera of the scene in this case. And then I'm trying to get the dot product of these two vectors. And the dot product is a mathematical operation that can be used as a measure of how much two vectors are parallel or perpendicular to each other. So when two vectors are close to being parallel to each other, the dot product will get close to one. And the more they are perpendicular to each other, the closer it will get to zero. And what's going to happen in practice if we're going to use this as a shader is that all the points that are sitting at the edge of the sphere right here are going to have this normal vector and it's represented in this image as well and the eye direction which is represented by the green vector will be almost perpendicular to the normal that is sitting at the edge and so we'll get to this case where the dot product is zero whereas all the points that are at the center of the of the sphere will point towards this direction which is almost parallel to the direction of the eye thus getting in the case where the dot product is one and this explains why the points at the center of the sphere are brighter compared to the points at the edges. And you might expect the points at the edge to be darker than they appear here, but the reality is that the dot product is not a linear function. So it will remain close to one until you get very close to being perpendicular to the surface. But thankfully, we can accentuate the effect with a power node. Now, what I didn't mention is that the dot product can also become negative. So if the direction goes in the opposite side, it will become negative. And so we have to fix that. We don't want that to happen. So the output of the dot product, we want to make sure that it's always between zero and one. And this is what the saturate node does. So if you're feeding a float to the saturate node, the float that comes out of it will be clamped to the zero one range. And here's what happens if we pick a number between zero and one and we elevate to, for example, three. Every number that is close to one, for the most part, will remain close to one. But as soon as we drop it, for example, to 0 0.8, then the resulting value will be closer to 0 0.5. And if we go to 0 0.5, then the output will be even lower, like 0 0.15.
And what's going to happen in practice in our shader is that all the pixels at the edge of the mesh, which were not very close to one, will get pushed down even more and appear much closer to zero. And all the points that instead were closer to the center of the mesh that were already close to one will, for the most part, remain close to one. You can change the exponent of the power node to any other value. And if you need, for example, a lighter effect, you can use a lighter value. If you need a stronger effect, you can increase this number and this will be the output. And I've also added another small change. Now I'm also using the one minus node to invert the output of the power node. Remember, everything that comes out of the power node is a number between zero and one. And all the values that sits at the center will be very close to one. And the values that sits at the edges will be smaller than one. Now, what should we do if we want these values to be close to zero and these values to be bigger than zero? Well, we could use the one minus node. Everything that you feed as an input to the one minus node will be returned as one minus the input value. And what's going to happen if we attach to the master node is that since the values that were at the center were very close to one, if we do one minus one, well, it will be very close to zero. And all the values at the edges were smaller than one. So when we do one minus a value that is smaller than one, we're getting a value that is definitely bigger than zero. And we're getting very close now. We just have to change the master node to a standard transparent material. Also create a new color node and assign it to the emission property. This will determine what's the color of the emission of the material. So what kind of light it will emit. And we'll also set the roughness to one. And if we attach the output of this node to the opacity slot, what we get in return is a material that is transparent at the center and opaque at the edges no matter where we're looking this material from. I'm changing the position of the camera now, but the output is always the same, which was exactly our initial objective. And I ended up using 1.5 as the power value, but feel free to experiment and find the number that works best for you. And there's research suggesting that alpha males always use lighters for this type of stuff. Great, now that we have our beautiful material, how do we use it? Well, we have to export it. We'll click the top left icon on the website and then click export. We'll choose self-hosted, Make sure that the reactory fiber preset is selected. Then we'll go over shader data and we'll copy the shader data inside a file in our project. Back to VS Code, I've created a new file for the shader data and I'll use it inside the Meteor component after importing no toy material and the shader data. And what we'll do now is an interesting trick. So we'll create a new mesh that has the same Meteor geometry that we're using on this one on top over here, but we'll use on it our new no toy material such that all the parts at the center of this mesh will be transparent and will show through the mesh that we have above it that is using the mesh transmission material. With this little trick, we can basically overlay the no toy material on top of the mesh transmission material to recreate the rim lining effect. And that's the end result. You can see that we are overlaying a new material on top of the mesh transmission material. And this time we'll have a nice rim light effect at the edge of the mesh. And I've used 1.5 as the power value. I believe that it is a little bit on the low side. So we'll increase it to 2.3 and then see what it looks like. There we go. I ended up using 2.5 to increase the strength of the effect. Re-exported the shader data and that's the final result. I think this already looks amazing as it is and all it took us to get there was just a few simple nodes and we can easily control and tweak every single value of our material and get immediate feedback on Note Toy until we get the perfect output. I hope you guys enjoyed this introduction to Note Toy. The next part will build a much more complicated material and I hope to see you there for part 3.